The first big RPG I ever played was Final Fantasy VII. It was also the first game I remember being kind of overwhelmed by. I was young, but even when going back to it recently, those feelings came rushing back. So Final Fantasy became a series I always had my eye on, though I do want to say I've only played a handful. 7, 8, 10, 10 to 12, 13, and now 15. Two of them have been some of my favorite games, a couple have been some, well, not good, and the others were just okay. I found 15 harder to place. To sum up, I guess I could just say, yeah, 15's okay and be done with the review, but there's more to it than that, and it wouldn't really be much of a critique. Obviously, most games are more nuanced than, this part is good, this part is bad, but I can't think of another game, at least right now, that is both bad and good at the same time in almost every aspect. I don't want to mislead anyone though, the game's a disappointment. Not just because of those bad parts, but because of how close they are to being good. It's been about a year since Final Fantasy XV came out, and there's been quite a few changes since the release of the game, so I think it's a good time to discuss what the game has become. I didn't have this channel back then though, so I'm going to start from scratch and review the entire game, but I will point out things that have changed, most of it being gameplay and not story. The game itself is very different from prior games. The most notable difference is that it's fully open world and has completely real-time combat. There are many others, but I think those are the most significant. Before I start, I'd like to mention that Final Fantasy XV has content that exists outside of the game. There's a short anime series and a CGI movie. I didn't watch the show, so I can't say anything, but I did watch the movie and my recommendation to anyone who wants to play the game is to not watch the movie prior as it does spoil some of the game, which I'll be doing the same, so here's your obvious spoiler warning. Anyway, I don't think you should be expected to watch media outside of the game for it to make sense, so I'm going to review it like that too. The game begins with a short cutscene of Noctis Lucis Kalen speaking to his father, King Regis, with his friends Promptor Argentum, Ignis Scientia, and Gladiolus Amicidia standing by, and that will be the last time I try to say their last names. Noctis is on his way to marry childhood friend Luna Freya Nox Flore in the name of a peace treaty with the Empire. The Niflheim Empire is at war with Lucis, the home of our main characters and where a large portion of the game is played. The capital, Insomnia, remains as one of the few areas not controlled by Niflheim. Luna was a princess of Tenebrae, which is controlled by the Empire. That's the most essential information without ruining what happens in the game. Anyway, Regis says goodbye and Noctis and Co. depart. Who's with you? Walk tall, my son. The gameplay opens with their car having broken down somewhere in the desert, actually not very far from their city. They struggle to push it, and with each delivering their quips, you're immediately introduced to each character's personality. I really like this intro because it gives us a simple premise in going to see an old friend and we see how our main four interact with each other. The lightheartedness makes us feel comfortable and we're ready to see where we go. So I present to you Final Fantasy XV. The screen fades and comes back to Noctis and his friends arriving in Hammerhead, a garage run by mechanic and old friend of Regis, Sid, with his <laughs> voluptuous granddaughter Cindy. As a hilarious prank, Regis left Noctis with no money despite being royalty, so to cover the repairs, Noctis must ask Cindy for a job to make some money, which introduces you to the combat. So after killing some monsters for Cindy, she repairs your car and your journey continues. She's almost too pretty for the road. The wedding is in a city called Altitia, which they need to take a boat to get to. They go to the Golden K, a restaurant in Small Pier, where they're met by a mysterious man who remains nameless to them. Although I'm going to save me the effort of doing this later, his name's Arden. I'm afraid you're out of luck. They have a strange interaction and he tells them there's no boats available. The boats bring you here. This attracts the attention of a nearby reporter who secures them a boat after helping him with a task. At this point, the story's going at a nice and calm pace, and nothing's really happened yet, which is good. Most likely you've only played for about an hour or two and expect to be introduced to Luna. That would be great, but then this happens. It turned out that the Empire broke the peace treaty and attacked Insomnia, killing Regis in the process. The group goes back to the outskirts of Insomnia to corroborate this information, but they also find out that Luna and Noctis' death have been announced. 
Noctis speaks to Kor, the Marshal of the Crown's Guard, who tells him to go back to Hammerhead. This is the end of Chapter 1 and the start of my disappointment. The actual developments themselves aren't necessarily bad. What's the issue then? My problem is that this happens too early in the story. We barely know Regis, we don't know Luna, we don't know anything about their city. The only thing given our knowledge of them that could make us care would be the relation to Noctis, but we don't really know him yet either. This isn't the only time the game tells us what to feel without really deserving it too. The event that occurred could have been really good, but we just don't care yet. And since the first eight chapters are all based off the same setting and this incident, it would have been more effective to have this event build up throughout the first four or five chapters maybe, rather than the beginning. Hell, I can't even imagine anyone actually being upset over these events. I assume they wanted us to feel like the characters and think like, oh my god, but rather I watched and was more annoyed than anything. I want to say I don't think it's always a bad thing to start off a story with a disaster, but the way it's presented here was just not good. Wait, isn't Luna dead? Well, no, the very first cutscene in Chapter 2 shows that Luna is alive still. So why did the game tell us she was dead? I suppose it's to add on to the events of the first chapter, but why bother if you're going to reveal it's not true so soon after? One could argue that you may know, but Noctis doesn't, but don't worry, it's not long before he finds out too. It just seemed unnecessary. They return to Hammerhead, and Sid tells them that the peace talks were just a front for the Empire to get close enough to steal the crystal and the Ring of Lucii. I'm not sure how Sid knows this, but here's some exposition. The crystal was given to Noctis' bloodline by the Astrals to protect from demons, and would eventually choose a King of Light to give all its power. The ring channels the power of the crystal to whoever wears it. Regis knew the Empire's intentions and gave the ring to Luna beforehand. Something I still don't understand is why Noctis had to be unaware of this peace treaty being a lie. To protect him is the obvious answer, but throwing him out into a land that isn't governed by his rule, but by that of an empire intending to kill him without arming him with this knowledge doesn't seem like much protection. They meet Kor nearby at a tomb of one of Noctis's ancestors. He tells Noctis that as king, he is duty bound to travel to all 13 tombs in Lucis and collect their power. This chapter is okay, but there wasn't really much to have happen after what happened in the first chapter. But my issue is actually because of the first chapter. A lot of the dialogue, particularly when they're with Kor, doesn't come across as, we just lost everything. I don't expect the game to be 100% committed to being morose afterward, but this is very shortly after and the tone felt kind of strange. The idea of Noctis having to gather the power of his ancestors is cool, but there is an enormous missed opportunity here that I'll come back to. In a short cutscene, we're introduced to the Emperor, who I'm actually not going to name because even though I looked up his name, I don't remember the game mentioning it even once. We also meet Luna's brother, Ravis, commander of the Empire's army, who is instructed to track down Luna and Noctis. Gladio is called by his sister, Iris, who asks to meet her in Lestalem, the largest city in Lucis outside of Insomnia, although that's actually not really saying much. I really like the entry to this new area. It's great and the scenery is really beautiful. It's probably my favorite location in the open world portion of the game. While they make their way to La Solemn, Luna has her own thing going on. Just a tiny bit more exposition to add on, Luna is known as the Oracle, who essentially acts as a messenger for mankind, particularly the king, to the Astrals. She's on her way to the site of Titan, a giant astral who is holding up a large meteor. She performs a covenant where she requests he grant his strength to Noctis. I don't completely know why the king himself couldn't fulfill this role, but I don't really have an issue with this. Wow. Just like when you enter this region at the beginning of the chapter, the entrance to Lestalem is also great. It might not be the best video game settlement ever, but the landscape surrounding it's really impressive, adding on to why I think this area is one of the coolest in the game. Once in Lestalem, they meet Iris, and you're also introduced to Jared and Talcott, two characters of implied importance, but in reality, they're just as relevant as any nameless character. Noctris receives a vision where he sees Titan at the Disk of Cothus, the site of the meteor, and they start to make their way there. Right before they leave, however, our mysterious stranger from the Golden K returns. The four clearly don't trust him, but decide to travel with him after he offers. So, I don't remember them ever talking about Noctis having to meet with any Astrals, which is fine because they decide to meet Titan on account of Noctis' headaches, but over a large portion of the game, these covenants play a major role and they never spend any time discussing them prior to when they start. 
It took me a second playthrough and some reading while writing this review to truly understand it all, and I admit that could be my own fault. But the game leaves out a lot of vital information. Luna having gone to Titan wasn't actually explicitly shown in the chapter like I said. The other thing about this chapter is the issue with tone again. There's also a chocobo forest. Now we're talking! Did you see that sign? Chocobos! Chocobos! When you enter the sky, the region this chapter takes place, Prompto notices a sign that points to a chocobo farm and expresses his interest in visiting. Chocobos! Chocobos! On its own, this is fine. This could be a fun detour if the story was doing anything else. Instead, it's someone who just lost their home and whose life is in risk suggesting they goof off with some animals instead of meeting with Gladio's sister and finding safety. Now this isn't an issue that only Final Fantasy XV has, but many open world games, but I'll talk more on that later. Is there a way back up? No, Shortly after bad. entering the Disc of Kothis, Gladio and Noctis become separated from Ingus and Prompto. At this point, the game decides we need some emotion. So out of nowhere, Gladio and Noctis become pissy with each other. Just offering sound advice. Yeah, like a parrot in my ear. No room for error here. No time to chill, either. Make it quick. And I'm sick of your endless whining. Calm the hell down. Get off my back. Are you a man of royal blood, or aren't you? They get heated, and Gladio gives some pep talk to Noctis to make sure he's taking his kingly stuff seriously, despite there not being a lot of reason to doubt that he is. This is another example of something that could have worked had the game made the player aware of a tension that built from something, rather than just throwing one in our face without prior buildup. And I mean that, I think the relationships are one of the strongest aspects of the game, and this conversation is a good example of it. They just needed to take it a bit slower. Noctis fights with Titan while also fending off Imperio forces, and asking Titan what he wants from him. This is where it's revealed that Luna had seen Titan prior, and Noctis understands that is the reason he came too. Afterward, as the area starts to fall apart, Arding comes in with an airship and offers a ride, but not without revealing his last name, Izunia, and that he's the Imperial Chancellor. Ignis knows the name and title, yet couldn't have guessed who he truly was when he heard his name was Arden, and apparently no one knows what anyone looks like. People can take pictures, okay? Prompto does for the whole game. It's his biggest personality trait, apparently. So why does no one know what an important figurehead in their most threatening opposition looks like? Uh, whatever. Anyway, they accept his help without any other option and are forced to leave their car behind. There's an interesting combat sequence here, but narratively the chapter's a bit messy. Noctis and Gladio's random argument, them actually accepting Arden's help while knowing he's a part of the Empire, and the fact that this whole Covenant thing at this point isn't really explained. It does show that Luna had visited, but we as players don't really know why yet. Is withholding information from us while also doing so for the main character a bad thing? Well, no, not conceptually. But the game seems to gloss over information quickly enough that you never really know if you're supposed to understand something or not, and it can feel pretty sloppy. Without their car, Noctis asks Cindy to try to find it. While waiting for that, a woman named Gentiana visits Noctis. She acts as the opposite to the Oracle, where she's the messenger to mankind on behalf of the gods. She tells Noctis to go see Luna once she's in Altitia. Before that, he must visit three runestones, which is the challenge to receive Rama's power, another god that Luna has been awakening. Goes hence in her king's name. She's a messenger. A spirit. Faithful to the Oracle. Oh, uh, for real? Okay, seriously, do they tell him anything? I want to talk about character work briefly after doing all of the story, but I wanted to point out one thing that seems weird throughout a lot of the game, and that's Prompto's attitude towards this adventure. One of the more prominent examples happens here. Look, over there. I bet that's the spot lightning struck. And we're supposed to go inside? Here we are, Vosha Hollow. It's not the only time Prompto will express fear when going into a dungeon or battle, but at other times we'll be suddenly almost excited to go. I don't even really get why they bring him when he seems so reluctant to be there. Maybe he's got some sick sense of enjoyment out of life-threatening situations. Despite Prompto's fears, they push through the cave and we see Noctis getting Rama's blessing. In order to reach Altitia, the team finds out of a boat hidden in Kayam that Gladio will call and have Iris procure. Before they can do that, though, Cindy calls Noctis and tells him that their car is in an Imperial base because Cindy is all-knowing or something. When they reach the base, they decide to stealth through it because Metal Gear Solid V was very successful and they wanted to cash in on that. 
After taking out the camp and finding the car, Ravis appears and threatens the group, which he decided to do so after the camp had been destroyed. Before anything happens, Arden comes in and keeps the peace, so to speak. What bothers me here is that even though Arden is high in command of the Empire, the Emperor himself wants Ravis to capture or kill Noctis, and he just doesn't do anything here, even though he can easily withstand Gladio with a single arm. Also, Prompto asks who he is, which is extra annoying because he's part of Noctis' crown's guard, which means you'd think he'd want to know all of the major characters in the Empire who Noctis might have to deal with. I guess I shouldn't be too surprised since they also didn't know who Arden was either. They return to Lestalm to meet Iris at the inn where you met her in the first place. Jared, the random old man who you knew nothing about, has been killed, and Talcott, the random little boy who you know nothing about, is very sad and Noctis swears revenge. Okay. I mean, look, they showed this short flashback of Jared from like two hours of gameplay ago. Even the game seemed to think you'd forget who this guy was. I have little to add to this chapter. Fighting the base was cool, aside from the stealth. Jared and Talcott seem to have known Noctis and crew beforehand, but we don't know to what capacity. And we don't know why Ravis cares about what Arden has to say when the Emperor already gave him orders. So continues the trend of we don't know in regards to almost everything in the story. Then it seems the reason that Ravis doesn't support Luna is that he doesn't think Noctis deserves to be the Chosen King. What is that Chancellor playing at? While heading to Kayam, a lighthouse in the south where they're setting up the boat, the team takes notice of another Imperial base and decides they should destroy it before leaving. Once inside, they use stealth again, trailing the commander who thankfully speaks out loud all his plans and feelings. He's angry that Arden sent a mercenary, RNA Highwind, to watch over him, and he also mentions having killed Jared conveniently, so now we can hate this character we've never heard of because he killed some irrelevant character we had seen for about two minutes. Shortly after, he says that Arden is the one behind the Magitech movement, where the Empire collects demons and turns them into troopers with their technology. You find out more about this later. After fighting through the base, you have a boss fight with Aranea that ends with her leaving. Once they're in Kayam, they find out that they need Mithril to fix the boat, which is apparently really rare, at least in this area. I don't know what it's needed for to fix a boat, and if it is required for boats in general, I don't know why it's not more readily available. Like, who's making all the boats? Well, they find a location, but it's being blocked by, you guessed it, the Empire. Gladio decides he doesn't care and says he has to go take care of something else, giving no clue as to what, and he departs. And that's all really. Meet Aranea, need Mithril, Gladio leaves, chapter over. When they reach the ruins where the Mithril is, Arden is already there, waiting to greet them, to no one's surprise. He speaks to Aranea briefly, who is no longer a mercenary but an actual part of the Empire, and then tells Noctis that he's okay to go in with Aranea as their guide under the ruse that they're new recruits. All clear. Go ahead. This part is super confusing because I'm not sure who they're trying to trick since no one else is here, and Aranea already knows who they are, so I don't know why she would go along with it. Arden helping them is nothing new, and he has an air of suspicion to him that you know will lead to something, so that makes sense, but otherwise this is weird. Anyway, Aranea leads them through the dungeon and opens up about her concerns with the Empire. They're using the ruins to harvest demons to make magic deck troopers, and she's considering leaving them. After retrieving the mithril, she offers them a ride to Lestalem, where they can refine their mithril at a power plant. Then we're stuck harvesting them. I don't think anything confused me more than it being Aranea helping you here, or the whole new recruit thing, but I think she's a decent character and I've always been a fan of the bad guy becoming good thing. Though I think her character and more side characters like her are terribly underused. I'm going to take a quick detour from the main story before finishing chapter 8 because I suppose you're wondering what Gladio was doing after he departed from the group. This turned out to be the first DLC for the game, it's not integral to the story, but it's worth mentioning quickly. After Gladio is so easily thrown aside by Ravis, he doesn't think he's strong enough to protect Noctis. Ancient ruins known as the Tempering Grounds housed the Blade Master Gilgamesh, who was once a shield of the king himself. The only person who had ever succeeded in exploring these ruins was Kor, so Gladio asked Kor to accompany him, and the two set out to the ruins. After completing the trials, Gladio defeats Gilgamesh and is granted his sword, deemed worthy to aid the true king. Gilgamesh also praises Kor's prowess, and the two leave. For someone that the game has talked up so much now, Kor doesn't seem to do anything at all the entire game, which is a little frustrating. The DLC isn't bad though, and I'm glad the information you gain isn't extremely important, but interesting enough as an aside from the main story. Speaking of which... When they return to Lestalem, they find that there's an issue with the power plant where there's demons inside. 
Noctis goes in to help and finds that Gladio's already there. When they exit, Gladio takes off his suit and reveals a couple new scars, and no one really presses him to explain. With the treated Mithril, the gang heads back to Kyan, where they board their boat with Sid to Altitia. It's a short chapter, but that's the end of the open world portion of the game and most of the simple plot developments. What's up? Please come back soon. We need our king. <laughs> yeah. Count on it. Since the game is drastically different from here on, I want to talk about what worked and what didn't for this portion of the game and how I would have changed it. Here's some issues I have if you didn't gather them from the summary. The pacing is terrible. It starts off with a major event and follows it with nothing even close to that magnitude, with some chapters having almost nothing of value added. Most of the non-main cast are made to seem important when they really weren't, and there weren't enough side characters that traveled with you. It glossed over important information that can make the story seem incomprehensible at times. Now, I feel like I may have made it seem like I hated everything so far, but it's not quite true. Some of the pros are really cool premises. Visiting the gods, collecting the royal arms, going on a road trip with your pals before getting married. They weren't executed phenomenally, but the groundwork is there. The main cast is likable for the most part. The dialogue is certainly not perfect, but the interactions themselves between the main characters are enjoyable. I said in the beginning that the intro was solid. On its own, that's still true, but in package with the rest of the first half, I don't think it does a very good job to set us up for what happens. It introduces you to the main four characters decently with the expectation that we'll get to know them over the next few chapters, but we don't. And by that I mean their backstory, rather than just how they talk and act. Instead, we get bombarded with disaster that we're expected to care about without having a reason to. Having a disaster that early gives no time to really examine the world and enjoy yourself before shit hits the fan. This is an issue I was talking about with many other open world games. Look, I like Fallout 4. Despite its flaws, I really enjoyed the game. But the story is terrible, and one of the main issues is the disconnect between what the character should do and what you want to do. You're unfrozen and your character's immediate wish is to find their kid, which is fine on its own, but takes you out of the game, making you feel pressured to do something important instead of exploring this vast world you're given. He's gone. God damn it. Someone took him. Someone stole my son! This is similar to Final Fantasy XV after the conflict begins. The game pressures you to continuing the story as it is an important matter for the characters. So when Prompto suggests going to visit the Chocobo farm, it just feels really odd. Chocobos! Chocobos! These characters just lost a lot, and one suggests they should just go goof around? It's not just Prompto though, a lot of the dialogue over the following chapters wouldn't suggest that something awful just happened. Here you are with this open world to explore, but going off and exploring would betray the tone the story is trying to establish. Ultimately, some players can ignore this and continue to explore anyway, but personally I don't like the idea of doing so until the story's at a calmer point, long enough after the incident that maybe the characters have had time to deal with what happened. It's hard to judge that in 15 though, because there doesn't seem to be much of a canonical passage of time determined, at least not that I could tell. That can get kinda hard for games like this though, because the gameplay has a day and night cycle, and so you could theoretically play for months before going to the next chapter. So, barring all that, what would I have done to make it different? To set it up, I would have had a longer intro and tutorial section. I would have liked to see more of Insomnia and how Noctis grew up. Maybe a couple sections separated by time skips to see how he meets Luna, Ignis, Gladio, and Prompto, and how he interacts with his father. After learning that Regis had known the Empire was coming, Noctis chastises him for not caring about the people of Insomnia and just saving him. A king is sworn to protect his people. And yet he chose to protect only one prince. Was that his calling? Forsake the masses to spare his own son? This seems a little selfish, but perhaps would have been more meaningful if we knew their relationship a bit better. So we get to see the city they love and how their relationships built up. This makes the eventual disaster stronger because we have some actual feelings for the characters. Though in my version, this disaster wouldn't have happened so soon, in fact, much later. In the current story, Noctis and Luna haven't seen each other for over 10 years, and it makes it hard to see them as actually caring about each other other than when they were just children in a couple of cutscenes. You could argue that they're still friends and their marriage is more of a political thing than actual love, but the two declare their love for each other so it's hard to make the distinction. That's not a problem exactly, but what is a problem is building up the relationship and taking so long for them to finally see each other. For me, I would have had them actually meet up earlier in the story, like maybe after the incident that sees Regis die. But I said that wouldn't have happened so early in the story, so if they don't go see Luna until after that, what would happen? The idea of Noctis having to gather the power of his ancestors is cool, but there is an enormous missed opportunity here that I'll come back to. I said that after the summary of Chapter 2, and this is why. Kor teaches Noctis that it's his kingly duty to receive all the ancient king's royal arms. 
Why not make this a princely rite instead? This way, Noctis has a date set for the wedding and leaves a couple weeks early so he can perform these rites as part of the road trip. It also allows you to explore the map uninhibited by a pressured storyline. Meanwhile, as the game progresses, the Empire's presence in various lands becomes larger, or Noctis notices them following him a little bit more, alluding to something nefarious. This gives him incentive to see Luna after all, even if there isn't a wedding, where he's able to gain some comfort from her, and they can go together to perform the covenants now that it's actually imperative he receives the help from the gods. It's not perfect, but the game would have benefited significantly from a slower opening. Maybe Square Enix thought people would be bored and needed something major early on. It doesn't really matter. I don't think the story was bad itself, but just poorly told and rushed. The writers seemed unwilling to flesh out the characters and world and let the story tell itself a little more. Had they done so, it could have actually been really engaging. It's not very good, but with some tweaking, could have been great. Okay, I'm speaking as if the game's over, and while it's not, I will say now that none of these issues are really fixed with the rest of the story. With eight chapters between the first and second major story development, and quite a bit of gameplay, the writers seem to jump the gun a bit, I'll call it premature climax. A lot more does happen in the remaining six chapters, but the game itself takes a pretty drastic turn. Because of that, I want to talk about the general gameplay and how it works for the first eight chapters, then return to the rest of the story. If you'd rather watch the rest of the story first, there are timestamps in the description. Luna? Yeah. Final Fantasy XV's gameplay takes the biggest departure from its predecessors. It shares the most similarities with XII, but they're still a far cry from each other. The gameplay can be broken up into various aspects. Combat, quests, exploration and dungeons, and minigames. It may not be limited to those, but that's what I'll be looking at. I'll start with the general ideas in combat, which I could break down a little further. Techniques and abilities, magic and summoning, weapons and accessories, items, ascension, and skills. For most of the game, you'll find yourself driving from place to place doing jobs for locals, killing monsters, delving into dungeons, as well as a couple more leisurely activities. The combat's simple. Hold circle to attack, hold square to phase through attacks, or tap it to dive roll, and X to jump. Triangle will warp you to a vantage point or will strike an enemy if you're targeting one. Now, occasionally this can feel good, but there's a very simple idea that makes Final Fantasy XV's combat so disappointing. Holding square or circle. On its own, it's just boring. Couple that with the kind of slow, drawn-out attack animations and the time between strikes, even for smaller weapons, it makes the combat feel bad, not just boring. The lack of feedback you receive when you only have to hold the button is dissatisfying. And by feedback, I'm referring to pressing a button and what happens on screen. It may not sound like much, but just pressing a button and the action performing once can make you feel more in control, and I know I may sound pedantic, but I really do feel that holding the button ruins the combat because you don't feel like you're actually doing anything. There are two games I want to briefly mention regarding this. Hollow Knight is not very similar to Final Fantasy XV, but this idea of feedback is relevant in pretty much every game, and I'll take any excuse to bring up Hollow Knight. Like Final Fantasy XV, there is a jump, an attack, and some movement and combat abilities. Unlike Final Fantasy XV though, each action requires a single press and each occurs very quickly. This allows you to swiftly chain other abilities and makes the combat feel fast and responsive. Hollow Knight does this extraordinarily well, though to be fair, since Hollow Knight is pretty different, this other game will make this argument more reasonable when comparing it to Final Fantasy XV. Kingdom Hearts 2 is also made by Square Enix and shares a very similar style of gameplay to Final Fantasy XV, fully real-time, fast action combat. There's an important difference though. In Kingdom Hearts 2, when you press attack, it strikes rapidly and once, just like Hollow Knight. There's also a dodge roll, and because the animations are quick, you can interweave attacks, dodges, magic, and other abilities seamlessly, but because each has a one-to-one -one feedback, it feels a lot more responsive and satisfying. Love it or hate it, Kingdom Hearts 2 has, in my opinion, really solid and fun combat, and it achieves this perfectly. Different games in their own right, but when a company has already done something like this so well, it's weird to see them stumble on it now. To its credit though, there's a bit more depth to the combat that I've gotten into, so let's get into those other aspects. It might sound redundant to have techniques and abilities here, but techniques are a specific set of moves each character has. By abilities, I'm referring to the combat mechanics. Overall, these are your main arsenal. Warping is pretty close to what I wanted out of regular attacks. No holding, you just press it and warp quickly to an enemy and can surely do it again. This is the feedback I was looking for in the rest of the game. It's a cool ability, though there is one issue I have with it. When you're in combat, you can be prompted to hold triangle and you will warp to a vantage point, often high up, where you can regenerate mana quickly and reposition. This is good, but it's often very restrictive, since you don't have that much control over where you can do it. Sometimes there's no warp points at all in a fight, where it seems like there could be. As well, there are only two times that you can do this. Combat, and in a DLC festival that I'll talk about later. 
This means that outside of combat, you can only warp straight on a horizontal plane. It could have made moving through certain areas quicker and more enjoyable if you could aim it manually, but unfortunately this is just another good idea with lackluster execution. I did say how I don't like how holding square phase is for you, but while it can be useful against some enemies, it's generally not that effective. Dodge rolling is much more effective as it grants immunity during the roll, and it's also a much more satisfying action. There is one more way to mitigate incoming attacks. Many enemies have certain attacks that can be blocked. When an attack begins, the prompt will appear on your screen to hold square. If you block the attack, you'll be prompted again to parry by pressing circle. Quick time events have the potential to be engaging and fun, but in most games just end up feeling like less interesting cutscenes. Especially in this game, they're very easy. The prompt to block appears as soon as the attack begins, and in most cases, that's an awful lot of time to react. And it doesn't really require any precise timing, you simply just have to hold the button. The follow-up parry is just as easy because the time is slowed and you're giving plenty of time to carry it out. I suppose my issue with most aspects of combat in general is that it's just too easy and lacks much mechanical input. In previous Final Fantasy games, characters always had a special ability that could be unleashed. 15's no different, though the formula is. While in combat, a tech bar will fill up in three sections, where Gladio, Ignis, and Prompto can use their powers, specifically called techniques. They won't activate them on their own, so you have to choose when to do so. Each will cost 1-3 to three bars and will buff allies, or damage or weaken enemies. Once an attack connects, you'll be prompted to do an extra strike with Noctis, similar to how the block and parry system works. The other benefit to these abilities is that Noctis and the ally who are casting it will be immune to damage for the duration, so they can be timed well to mitigate incoming attacks. These are generally enjoyable to use because they're effective, they strengthen the emphasis on working as a team, and add a bit of depth to the fighting. They're not perfect as it cuts game time away from Noctis to focus on the character casting the ability, essentially playing a short, interactive cutscene, but they are a welcome part of the game. Noctis has an ability too, but it functions differently. He, unlike the others, only has one, and it's probably the worst defender for how boring and uninvolved the combat can be. The ability is called the Armager, which uses its own unique resource bar that persists outside of combat. Once this is activated, Noctis will use the power of the royal arms he's collected and begins an onslaught of powerful attacks against the targeted enemy. You hover above the ground, moving very quickly, and can't fall below 1 HP. This means that you can hold circle and demolish many enemies in a short amount of time, or take a chunk out of a boss's health. Even though the main combat is bad for similar reasons, I would recommend not using Armager if you want the fights to retain any shred of fun. Not just because it's even lower effort than the regular attacks, but also because I think it's just too strong, though I might not even have a problem with that if it took any mechanical skill to utilize. This becomes an issue in a couple more important boss fights later in the game, but we'll get to that. There are a couple other smaller abilities that can take place in battle called Link Strikes. If you attack an enemy from behind, or after some parries, you can join up with a nearby ally for a combined attack. These can make the teamwork aspect of the game feel a little more cohesive. There are nothing special, but fit in nicely. Cross Chains are something that were added more recently, where you can Warp Strike a vulnerable enemy to initiate a quick time event, where you press circle when told to up to 10 times. This is outrageously boring, for the same reason parrying is, but even more so because you get to do it 10 times. I don't know why anyone thought this was a good way to add more ally cooperation. Like the rest of the game, magic works pretty differently from previous titles. Fire, Blizzard, Thunder, Cure, Haste, Bio, Gravity, there are always many types of magic. This isn't as true in 15. Instead of adding a spell to your repertoire and using mana to cast it, Noctis collects fire, ice, and lightning as a resource and uses them for crafting spells, which can be given an added effect when mixed with an item. These effects could be poison, self-healing, or even adding multiple occurrences to each cast. To use these spells, you lob them to a targeted area like a grenade. Spells have the potential to do impressive damage, but the magic is held back by two things. The first being that crafting is too cumbersome, taking too long to craft a spell that has limited uses and a cooldown between them. The second is a lack of variety, sure, bio and cure aren't completely gone as magic, because you can have those as added effects to your spells, but they don't feel like their own spell in that case, particularly with cure. Haste and slow were mostly present in prior games, and were important in strategies for many bosses. I could admit haste might have felt strange in this game, but slowing the enemies could have had a fun effect on gameplay. It's definitely not fair to criticize it simply for parting from previous games, but it was just too stripped down. With the large groups of enemies you can fight, there are a lot of spells that would have been awesome. Let's compare it to Kingdom Hearts 2 one more time. Its magic system was simple but was engaging to use, and one of my favorite spells was Magnet. It caused all nearby enemies to draw into an area, causing damage and giving you a chance to strike them all in a bunch. This is a really fun ability, and I actually found out well into my time playing Final Fantasy that it does exist in this game too, but in a weapon rather than a spell, so I'll be talking about it in an upcoming section. I'm sounding like a broken record because I've said this about pretty much every aspect so far, but 
The magic system isn't that far away from being genuinely really good, it wouldn't be a massive reform or anything. But it is worth pointing out that the multiplayer DLC has made changes to how magic works for the better from what I've seen. But I won't be talking about the DLC in this video as I won't have enough time to properly play it before this video comes out. This brings me to summoning. Now, even in the ones that I've loved, Final Fantasy games have always had a lot of visual flair that seem like they either compensate or distract from how turn-based combat can often be uninteresting. Excluding one game, summons at their best have just been spells with cutscenes. At their worst, they're, well, uh, long cutscenes, I guess. The exception is Final Fantasy X, where they were used as an ally in combat, which was really cool. But in 15's fashion, it's been dumbed down a little bit more. When in combat, the game will roll every 10 seconds and determine whether or not you can summon. Which summon is available depends on certain requirements. These rolls are random, meaning summoning is mostly not in your control. The longer the fight goes on, the more likely it is, and more often when you or your allies are low in health. So not only can you not control when you want to summon, the game gives you a bailout when low in health because it raises the chance to use summons. And like I said about Visual Flare, these are truly a visual spectacle. But that's it. They're a get out of jail free card that does massive damage. It's a pretty cutscene, but I have to assume that it's so marvelous to distract from the fact that you aren't doing anything. Or maybe they're rare because it makes them feel more special? Well, that's a terrible design in my mind. That, and in my 130 hours of gameplay, I summoned Rama almost every single time, and have never summoned Titan once. Though I think that's because Rama has the easiest requirements. I think they would have been more enjoyable if they went the Final Fantasy X route and made the summon appear as allies. Though in 15 they're enormous gods, so perhaps Noctis could have entered a transformative state based on the summon that was used. That would make them more interactive and could have been an alternative to the Armager, so Noctis has more abilities at its disposal. It would also make more sense lore-wise because it was a blessing given from the Astrals, rather than them just appearing and cleaning Noctis' mess. At the very least, they could have added some variety, unfortunately that's not the case. Everyone in the party has two types of weapons they can use. The exception is Noctis, who can use any type of weapon he wants, though he does have a unique one of his own as well. For a significant portion of my playtime, essentially my entire first run through and much of my second, I only used Noctis' regular sword, and I'm assuming most people did the same. Somewhere in my second playthrough though, I decided to get the strongest of each type of weapon and see how they all held up to each other. I'll tell you right away, don't use anything but swords, great swords, and daggers. Some other types can be good against enemies that are weak to them, but even in those cases, the three that I listed are typically going to be just as good. I'm not going to go over how to get each best weapon, but I want to specifically mention one of Noctis' best swords, the Ultima Blade, and how easy it is to get compared to some others. Early in the game, you get a quest from Sid to bring him some materials to upgrade your starting weapon. The first two are easy because both require an item that you'll come across many times. The third is weird though because it's only difficult to obtain due to luck rather than any skill. You have to complete a specific hunt where one of the two enemies will drop it, and if they don't, you just have to do it again. I'm not sure if it's required, but it helps to break off their horn, and while I'm mentioning that, I do want to say I like being able to target different parts of enemies, it's a good aspect of combat. Anyway, this is super tedious and I think I had to do the hunt maybe 9 or 10 times before I finally got it, but they're low level enemies so you can actually get one of Noctis' best weapons well before you've done the chapters I've already gone over. Though to be fair, I don't think I've ever felt overpowered with any weapon including getting Ultima early. In fact, I'd often say I feel like I don't do enough damage even to enemies well below my level. To contrast that with other top tier weapons, most of them are locked behind beating the story before you can get them, so the Ultima Blade kind of stands on its own in that regard. Daggers are good because of the fastest weapon and is probably the closest to Hollow Knight I'm going to get in this game. The feedback isn't any different, but there is more room to reposition and the animations are much quicker. Great swords are good because the damage they do is worth the time it takes to attack with them. As for the rest, well, firearms are trash. The benefit is being ranged, but they're so weak that it might explain why Prompto is so useless. Actually, while I mentioned Prompto, why the fuck does he stand so close to enemies? Anyway, I actually thought I was going to love spears, unfortunately they're almost as cumbersome as great swords which feels out of place because you'd expect them to be a bit quicker, but they also don't do nearly as much damage. Shields are what you'd expect when you hear shields. They deal okay damage for defensive weapons, but they're kind of pointless. There are plenty of ways to avoid attacks, so they just feel irrelevant. There is one other type of weapon that's worth more of a mention than the others. Machinery. With one equipped, Triangle serves as a unique ability instead of warping. The two that come to mind are Poisonous Cast and a Gravity Well, the ability similar to Kingdom Hearts 2's Magnet. The issue is that it's very weak, and the same could be said about all of the other machinery. Warping is one of the best things in combat too, so using a weapon that gets in the way of that is a hindrance to me. I can't help but wish the abilities here were added to magic instead of what they are here. 
Last are the Royal Arms, the optional weapons Noctis can collect. They range through each type of weapon aside from machinery, but they have a drawback of their own where you damage yourself as you attack. I wanted to use these all the time, but I could never find a sweet spot where the damage I was taking was worth it, especially because they're outclassed by regular weapons. There is one more weapon that Noctis can get, but I'll have to return to that after I do the remaining 6 chapters of the story because that's where it's unlocked. Outside of that, there are DLC weapons that I didn't really touch because they mess with the progression of the game. You can start with the Genji Blade from Gladio's DLC, but it's a lot stronger than any of the starting weapons, so I don't really like using it. A lot of the previous games had armor you could wear too. 15 has outfits that you can change, but these are mostly aesthetic. They have some stats to them, but they're largely negligible, and for some reason they give Noctis way more than everyone else. There is one that I would call armor though, added in an update in July of this year called the Magitech Exosuit. This is arguably the most overpowered thing in the entire game. While wearing it, it gives you invincibility for 30 minutes upon taking damage, and takes 20 hours to recharge when it's done. Basically, this means that anytime you have a difficult fight, you can wear it and win for free, as there are no fights that take longer than 30 minutes, save for one that I hate to say this over and over, I'll talk about later. Now, it's optional, but I don't get why anyone would want this. If the combat's already not that fun, and you're making it go from easy to lacking difficulty at all, then I don't see the point in even playing the game. I also put accessories in the title of this section too, but there's a lot less to talk about. You have equipment slots that you can put accessories that increase HP, offensive stats, defensive stats, nullify status effects, etc. These are good, but there's not much to say. So if there's no cure spell, how do you heal? There are a couple ways, but primarily you'll be using items, specifically potions. Rather than being a set amount like in most Final Fantasy games, potions will heal 50% of your current maximum health. I say current because when you lose all your health, you enter a down state where your maximum health will begin to go down. During this state, you have two options. You can either use an item to heal, or one of your allies will run over and help you up, restoring an amount of health depending on how upgraded you are. This is an interesting aspect to combat where you can also return the favor to your downed allies. Well, it would be interesting if your friends wouldn't waste their time running around while you wait for them to come over and help you as your maximum health runs lower and lower. That's where elixirs come in handy. They restore your MP and maximum HP. I actually do like the idea of your maximum health dropping until you're able to find somewhere to rest. This adds an interesting mechanic to areas where there's prolonged combat. Now, the issue here is how quickly your max health drops. So you end up relying quite a lot on items, which also end up being very abundant by the time you start fighting monsters that do decent damage. The game throws a lot of items at you whose only uses are for selling, making even high elixirs easy to obtain a large amount of because you get so much money. I would have liked to see elixirs be very rare and maximum health dropping much, much slower. That way when you're actually at a low amount of max HP, there's a genuine sense of danger. Though that would mean they have to seriously rethink how death works to begin with. When your maximum health falls to zero, you enter another, even more downed state, where the screen focuses on a new and gives you one single option, a phoenix down. Phoenix Downs have always been used to revive fallen party members, but you had to take an action away from one of the other members to do it. In 15, the game says, okay, one more try, and stays on Noctis for 10 seconds or so, until you just select the Phoenix Down and revive yourself. If you wait it out, you'll game over and reload your last save file. In my, again, 130 plus hours of this game, that happened to me twice outside of a certain dungeon that I'll get to later in the video. The first of these two times were in my first playthrough against the final boss, where I had just forgotten to replenish my Phoenix Downs. The second was when I drove off a bridge to see if I could and fell to my death on purpose. So not only are items so common that you can help yourself out of a downed state no problem, but even if you're not able to, the game bails you out again with a phoenix down. This makes death pretty much impossible and just like combat, it has some of the ideas right but they were executed poorly. There were more than a few cool dungeons in the game that could have been even more tense if you saw your maximum health lower slowly if you weren't able to win every fight without trouble. There are other items, but nothing substantial. Items that remove negative status effects, added positive ones, and that's essentially it. In the most recent Final Fantasy games, they've featured a board system where you put points towards each character to unlock further abilities and stats. I like this kind of idea, particularly in 10. It could be a bit cumbersome, but generally I like the progression. 15 has a similar idea with Ascension, where you spend points on upgrades for a lot of different things. However, since the game focuses heavily on Noctis, most of the sections are based on him. On the board, we have Armager, Magic, Recovery, Techniques, Combat, Teamwork, Stats, Exploration, and Weight Mode. Weight Mode is an optional setting where gameplay pauses when you cease moving in battle. This gives you time to look around and you can use Libra to faster to see enemy weaknesses. I guess this can be kind of similar to how turn-based games worked in a way, but generally I think it's kind of boring. 
All in all, I don't have much to say about it. I think the Ascension Board is okay for the game, but I would have preferred a more meaningful progression if the game was a little deeper. I suppose I was just hoping for more abilities. A lot of the upgrades in the Ascension Board are get more AP for driving, or you have more health now, or you can wear three accessories now. That's not totally fair, there are some that add maneuvers in combat, but they're nothing substantial. So that makes techniques, abilities, and skills. Yep, but skills refer to something not involving combat though. Each character has their own with its own progression. Noctis has fishing. This minigame is not any worse than most regular fishing games, which isn't saying much, but if you're into that, it's not bad. Not really all that exciting to me though. But if you are one of those lucky ones, you'll be even happier when the VR fishing comes out. Square Enix has been supporting the game nicely, but that's definitely a strange one. Gladio has survival. At the end of a fight, survival gives you a chance to pick up a random item. The higher the level, which you improve simply by walking, you will be able to get some more valuable items. This is useful, but nothing too amazing. Ignis' skill is cooking. While playing, you have the choice to sleep at either hotels or campsites, which is actually how you gain your experience. At campsites specifically, Ignis will have a chance to make food for the team. You can gather and buy ingredients around the map that will give your team different effects. This is a good part of the game. It builds the feeling of teamwork and can be a good way to strategize before a fight. Prompto's skill is a little different. Photography. In battle, Prompto will take various pictures that you can choose to save every time you sleep. There are areas where Prompto wants to take a picture and you can choose to go there, and you can also take some manually. There's not a whole lot to say about these skills. They're a cool way to make each character a bit more unique and they add a bit of depth to the game. So we're done how combat works, now I'm going to talk about what it's used for. The bulk of your time will be spent doing various quests for people around the world. For most open world games, a lot of quests are one of two simple premises. Go here, kill thing, return. Go here, collect thing, return. There are times where this isn't always the case, but from what I've seen, this is usually how they work. This isn't a bad thing, typically, because that's all games can even do. What makes some games better than others for this is how the quest is covered up with context. A game that does this very well is Fallout New Vegas. A lot of the quests boil down to the same concept of killing something or grabbing something, but the quality of writing and characters distract from the quest being such a simple concept. It's part of what makes the quest so good. It also has a lot of longer quest lines, rather than just being a single one-off. A game that does this very poorly is Horizon Zero Dawn. Almost every single quest is obtained from a generic, effectively nameless NPC that stiffly tells you to go do one of those basic tasks. You return and then that's it, every time, and none of them are really masked with interesting reason. Final Fantasy XV is closer to Horizon in that regard though, the side quests aren't very good. There are often a short series rather than one-offs, but every single item in a series is usually identical except for the item you're getting. Some of them are as simple as going to grab a crop for a food stall in Les Stalem. Ah. But that's it. What's worse is that, and I've said this before, no one seems to know who the hell Noctis is. They're asking a king to do these extraordinarily simple tasks that they should have had covered already since they're a business. I just don't know why all these places need Noctis to act as their delivery guy, that can't possibly be viable business method. I stumbled through many of these quests just to review the game, and to me they felt like they were just thrown in to lengthen it, an afterthought. Or they just felt like placeholder quests that have yet to been given to the writing team. There are quite a lot of them, but only a few have any uniqueness to them, and I, I tried, I just I couldn't beat them all. Later into the game they added timed quests. These are quests that involve killing a lot of monsters in a certain amount of time to compete with people online for the highest score. Each quest is only available for a limited amount of time before it's changed. You receive a currency for them that can only be used in a special shop to buy items, unique weapons, AP, or gill, or even experience. These can keep the game a bit from getting stale, which is fine, it's just that the prizes are kind of overpowered in my opinion. There are a few things that are overpowered that I've said and people could just tell me not to use them but that doesn't excuse imbalance or bad design, not in my mind anyway. But it's not as bad as it could have been. What was really terrible is the music that plays in these quests. And while I'm still saving music for later in the video, I just want to point out specifically how awful the song is that plays during these. Early in the game, you save someone known as a hunter, who does exactly what it sounds like. They hunt monsters. There onward, many of the quest givers call you a hunter as though they know who you are. If they know you're a hunter, then you'd think they'd also know you're a king, but alright, I'm done complaining about that. Hunts are a type of quest you receive from tipsters located in every settlement. There's no story to them, it's like a wanted poster. Take it and go kill the monster and come back for a reward. These are fine to not have story because they work as an aside to regular quests. The problem with them is that they didn't do what 12 did with its hunts. 
To my memory, 12's hunts worked very similarly, but they were always a unique enemy. I could be wrong about that, but for the most part they were. In 15, while I haven't completed every hunt, and I likely won't, there are very commonly not a unique enemy. You could say that's nitpicky because there are so many hunts, but it's more of a world immersion thing to me. There are wanted posters, there are people that work as hunters, but sometimes you'll go complete a hunt by killing a small number of generic monsters that respond not only there, but turn up in many locations elsewhere just as regular monsters, since hunts spawn a specific set. I appreciate the number of hunts in 15, but at the same time, maybe they should have had less and made them more interesting. It seems strange to have a wanted poster for something that is essentially a wolf. To be completely fair though, there are some unique monsters that can be found in the later ranks of hunts, but getting them is a bit of a chore since hunts have their own leveling where harder ones are locked out until you reach the required rank, increased by doing hunts. I don't mind that specifically, but I think it's too slow to reach those higher ranks. Originally my script here complained about not being able to do more than one hunt at a time and how stupid that was. Square Enix has had monthly updates since release, and the update this month, November, finally upped the limit from 1 to 10. I don't know why it has a limit to begin with, and I don't know why it took them a year to change it, but it's definitely way better now. Funnily enough, particularly with hunts, all of these side quests could have felt a lot better if my version of the story was the one in the game. They suffer from the same issue of Prompto wanting to see chocobos. It's simply not the time to go off and help people with little monsters or getting a carrot for their farm. Noctis has the Empire to worry about. But in my version, these quests and hunts would serve as a good purpose to explore the rest of the world that the Royal Arms don't bring you to. It wouldn't make the quest any more interesting, but it would make it a little easier to bear since I could view it as a future king wanting to help the people. Other than that, I don't really have any solid ideas on how to fix the quests. I like writing, but I'm not going to try to write quests for them. And yes, I am making the claim that I could write better side quests, though to be fair, I think anyone with even a small interest in writing could probably do the same. So, I said that I had instances of liking the game and even almost loving it, so why does it seem like I'm just shitting on it? That's gone through my mind the entire time I've been writing this, I think I've done a good job explaining how I think improvements could be made, but the general tone of the review has certainly been negative. I think this is simply because of how excited I was for the game, expecting a 10 out of 10, and was really disappointed. Contrast that with something like Ukulele. I was excited for that to come out and held off on release to see reviews, something I actually don't normally do. It did not get very high praise, but I decided I'd like to see for myself. I got the game expecting it to be a less than enjoyable experience because of reviews. Call me stupid for buying a game I don't expect to like, but I prefer to decide for myself rather than let reviews tell me what to think. Which is rich coming from me considering I'm in the middle of a review, I know. Anyway, I actually had a much better time than I was expecting. It's not a stellar game, and if I were to score both of these games, they wouldn't be that much different. But the difference comes from the expectation to reality. If I reviewed it, my tone would be generally positive because of what I experienced was better than what I thought it was going to be. Maybe I should try to avoid that attitude when reviewing, but I haven't done so thus far, so I'm not going to. That may have seemed long-winded, but I just wanted to explain why my critique has sounded pretty negative so far while also saying I loved the game at times. This also leads into the section that I really do like, the exploration. Actually, it was originally one of the more annoying parts, and like my suggestions so far, a pretty minor change made me completely flip-flop. The original issue was the vehicle. It couldn't drive off the road, and you didn't even have full control over what you did with it when on the road. When off the road, you either ran or rode a chocobo. Running was bad because of a stamina bar that has no red existing in this game. Aside from realism, it serves no purpose other than inconveniencing the player. That and there's a small trick to replenishing your stamina fully when it reaches empty. The trick is so easy to do that it doesn't even make sense to have stamina bar in the game, but okay, obviously running isn't the best way to get around such a big world, that's why there's chocobos. They have stamina too, but generally they feel good to control and are much faster. The one thing I don't like is that you never get to own your own chocobo. You use the same one throughout the game that can be leveled and customized, but it's always a rental. A rental that is so cheap that you can always have it active for little cost, and it can be activated in every settlement. So I'll ask, why did they even bother making it a rental? This is nitpicky, I just wish I could have owned it myself. But chocobos on their own aren't all that fast, so a lot of locations far off the road become a chore to go to. That and a ton of the map isn't actually available. A quick look at the map, which is weirdly low res, you'll see a very large one. But looking at mine, there's quite a lot that is shaded. None, or at least most of that, is completely unavailable. The map is just an illusion of size. It's still pretty big in its own right, but still a bit of a trick in my opinion. Alright, I, I said it was going to be positive. In an update in June, a newer type of car was added, the Regalia Type D, the third type of car in the game and the second one I'll talk about after. This is a monster truck style of vehicle that allowed for off-road driving. It also has a jump feature which made for some fun traversal. I'm not exaggerating when I say that this made the exploration go from a chore to something I wanted to do all the time. 
15 has an auto drive function that can be used to quick travel to any parking spot or settlement for the irrelevant price of 10 gil. Actually, the game also has an option to return you to your vehicle if you're not in combat in a similar way, meaning you can go from nowhere near your car to the opposite end of the map in a few minutes, which are mostly just loading screens. With the addition of this vehicle though, I actually found myself driving long distances simply because it was more fun to go off-roading. The very first thing I did, and I doubt I'm alone in this, was I went to the large rock formations to see if I could drive across them. To my very pleasant surprise, I could, and I enjoyed it. This also brings up one of the few deaths that I had. I already showed footage of it, but I jumped off a bridge over a large chasm to see what would happen. I guess I shouldn't be surprised that I died, I was just surprised it allowed me to though, because, and here's the inevitable negative parts of this vehicle, there are a lot of areas in the game that the car is not allowed to go to. I don't mean it's unreachable, I mean you can jump up to a spot that the game will move you down from with Gladio saying, Whoa, where do you think you're going? And there are tons of these. It's the main issue with this car. It's unfinished. Some of the collisions are clunky and weird, you drive through railings, and there are areas where you were never meant to go that you could now that they didn't add anything to. They just decided to fade you back to where you jumped from in order to keep you from going there, and that's pretty disappointing. Still though, the car was a lot of fun just to screw around with, and I would have liked to see more stuff like this in the game. The other vehicle though. It can only be obtained after you beat the game. It turns your car into the regalia type F, which can fly. Before adding the type D, this was the only way to take your car off the road. It was a much faster way to get around, though it still felt kind of slow to pilot. This one also has one major issue to me though, and that's the amount of control you get. You can fly into the ground, which will cause a game over, but the game doesn't really want you to. Anytime you lower your altitude, it tries to correct you upward. This is one of the reasons No Man's Sky sucks, but at least Final Fantasy XV made crashing possible. Landing was pretty disappointing too. It's super inconsistent and it isn't completely manual. You just lower your altitude over a road and press X when it lets you. I don't really enjoy using it. When I heard there was going to be an airship, I was hoping for something more impressive. But there is one very, very good thing this brought. Final Fantasy VII was filled to the brim with hidden things. That's one of the things I loved about it. I adore when games aren't afraid to actually hide things from you. There's a hidden area in the top left of the map that you can only get to using this flying car. You struggle to land in a ruined kind of area and make your way towards the dungeon. I'm gonna skip this dungeon until post-game talk, but I just want to say that this is one of my favorite areas. It's not the coolest looking, it doesn't have the coolest enemies, but it's secret and not something you would likely stumble upon on your own since you wouldn't think to go there. It's not so hidden that it's impossible to find unless you get the quest involved, which is good. That brings up a different point though. Quests can be used to send someone around to various parts of a map, and that's good, but I don't think every single location in a map should have a quest tied to it, or at least not have a quest that brings you there. I want there to be some sense of achievement in finding something by exploring that you wouldn't have found any other way. Unfortunately, at least I think this is the case, there is no marked location on the map that you won't end up going to by doing every quest, and not even every quest, just some. There may be some small outposts that you don't go to, but those are copied and pasted around the map. Dungeons and other interesting locations though all have some sort of quest that brings you there. This isn't a make or break kind of thing, but I just generally don't like having a way to find every location without having to just explore on your own. That's why I like the dungeon I mentioned just a moment ago. There is a quest, but it's one you wouldn't just get normally. On the east edge of the Stalum, there's a window you have to interact with only at night time and it'll start a short quest. This is out of the way enough that most players aren't going to find it. In fact, I didn't know about this dungeon until I was reading about the Regalia Type F, which admittedly I felt a little foolish. Point being, this was a good area of the game. I'm not going to go through every dungeon because they're largely the same and this video is long enough. I just want to touch up on their general design and inclusion. I like the idea of open world games having dungeons. That's a pretty broad statement, but I just like having several unique areas to crawl through that all come from one area. The dungeons are okay. Visually, some of them are pretty boring though, just caves. Two of them are more castle themed. For dungeons, the major issue is the camera and the size of the area to fight. Clearly, the game was made for open areas. When you're in a narrow space in a dungeon, the camera gets very close and walls interfere with it. And the fights get very cluttered. It can be pretty hard to tell what's going on, and there aren't many areas where the dungeons open up either, so it can be a bit of a pain to go through some of them. One of the better ones is in the second half of the game. It's a forested, swampy area that looks nice and has an interesting tone because of the story. It's also a lot more open than the dungeons you find in the open world. There is one dungeon in particular in the open world that I liked, the Rock of Rabbita, and I hope I'm saying that right. It's a mountain that you have to climb up while fighting enemies with a couple of branching paths. One issue I have with it though is there's a very large open area near the end. It looks absolutely perfect for a boss fight. 
I got there and nothing spawned. I looked up what the deal was and it turned out that the boss is linked to a hunt, meaning if you don't have the hunt active, then you can't fight the boss. This also means that when you go back and activate the hunt, provided you didn't do so before your first time, then you have to go back through the dungeon again. I found that pretty annoying. Mostly though, the dungeons just felt too cramped and some had a pretty boring design. There were a few that I did enjoy and I liked the inclusion. There are three things that you do outside of fighting and doing quests, and I think minigames is probably the best term to use. One of them is Noctis' is fishing though, and I've already talked about that. The second one is chocobo racing, which I thought was pretty cool. It's bare bones unfortunately, there isn't a lot of content regarding it. I wish there were more courses, mostly. I have hope that the multiplayer update will bring chocobo racing against other people. Some people watching this likely already know the answer, though I've held off on touching the comrades update until I finish this video. Technically we haven't come across the other minigame because it only takes place in Altitia, but because this section is so small I might as well just say it here. There's a coliseum where you can bet on monsters that fight against each other. This is, completely seriously, the most boring thing in the entire game probably by a long shot. I'm not sure how good the prizes are or if there's something I missed that you can do the more you do it, but just watching these stupid monsters slowly duke it out was some of the dullest gameplay I've ever seen. I was hoping that the Colosseum was going to be for Noctis trying to see how long he could keep fighting things like the Battle Arena and the Golden Saucer in Final Fantasy VII. This wasn't the case and it made me pretty sad. That's it for minigames and it was a pretty short section but I thought because it was pretty different from the rest of the game it deserved its own mention. I have no idea where to put this and since I still don't I'm going to give it its own little mini part. The devs of Square Enix decided that you should interact with things in the game with the same button that you jump with. That on its own isn't the worst thing ever, games have done that before. But whoever worked on this particular inclusion was either lazy or incompetent. The amount of times I have jumped multiple times while trying to interact with something or pick something up is extraordinarily infuriating. It seems like not that big a deal until you do it 10,000 fucking times over your playthrough. That's all I have to say about it, but oh my god, this was terrible. So that's Final Fantasy XV's gameplay in the general sense. It's what you'll be doing for most of your time playing the game. However, each of the next few chapters play like their own game, unlike the openness to the first eight. Because of that, I'll go over story and gameplay changes per chapter rather than what I just did. After chapter 14, I'll go through the post-game content and DLC events. I'm also going to properly summarize my feelings towards the game regarding story, characters, and gameplay. I'll finish with the visuals and soundtrack. If you're still listening to this, I really appreciate you giving me your attention and not too much longer now. The chapter starts with a lengthy boat ride to Altitia. Rather than marriage though, the purpose is to perform a covenant with Leviathan, another astral. While you're in the city, the Empire demands that Luna is handed to them. Even though Altitia is part of the Empire, technically, they have their own government who has Luna in their custody. Noctis steps in to negotiate with Camellia Claustra, the first secretary of Altitia. Noctis assures that the people will be safe during the covenant and handing over Luna would be a bad choice and Camellia agrees. The Empire begins an attack on the city and Noctis goes to Luna and Leviathan while Ignis, Gladio, and Prompto go off to help the citizens. Noctis engages Leviathan in a fight while parts of the city swirl in the vortex. After the first phase of the fight, Noctis is injured. To his side, Arden appears before Luna and that's when this happens. After Arden walks back onto his airship, Luna uses some energy to call the power of the Royal Arms to Noctis, giving him some strength and returning him to battle for a second phase. He is weakened once more and Luna uses her last strength to heal him. Titan fights off Leviathan and Luna dies. During this, she also gives Noctis the Ring of Lucii. This is the end of the chapter and the start of my disappointment. Oh wait, no, I already used that one, but it was pretty disappointing. In my first playthrough, I absolutely did not expect Luna to die, at least not there, so that was pretty surprising, but it wasn't really sad though. For the same reasons I talked about in the first story section, we just didn't know her enough yet. All we had seen her in were some cutscenes from when she was a child and some more current cutscenes that just showed what she was doing, and not really anything about her. In the synopsis for chapter 9 that I was reading, it's written at the end as though it was supposed to be a surprise that Arden is the main villain. I may have misread it, but it's strange because it should be extraordinarily obvious to everyone except for the main characters for some reason. But anyway, yes, Arden is indeed the main antagonist if you haven't grasped that yet. Luna's death wasn't poorly presented, but as always, I just wasn't empathetic. By now there's a good chance that you do care about our main four guys, their interactions are generally okay throughout the game, at the very least they felt real within the context of the game. So for some, perhaps Luna's death was very sad, maybe they did care about Noctis enough that this is heartbreaking. 
I wouldn't say I don't care at all about Noctis and the rest, but Luna had seen so little screen time that she just seemed kind of minor. Again, if my version of the story was the games, perhaps she would have been built up a little better. Hearing about someone rather than actually experiencing them for a long time and then seeing them die just isn't strong enough for me. The gameplay for Chapter 9 is pretty different from 1 through 8. There are a couple of hunts, but outside of that, in the Leviathan section, there's no combat. It's a large, beautiful city with various shops and the Colosseum I spoke about earlier. Unfortunately, the amount of city that is accessible is much less than what Alticia looks like. Although I did quite like this part, it wasn't phenomenal execution, but I was genuinely wowed when I saw the city and I liked the environment, despite how I felt about the narrative events here. This world could use some wisdom. My major issue is the fight against Leviathan itself. The first section is spent dodging attacks and doing minuscule damage. I wasn't even sure if I was doing it right because of how little I was doing. But after doing a bit more damage, the cutscene where Luna is stabbed is triggered. The second part is a complete joke and one of the easiest fights in the game. It's greatly cinematic and in that respect it's awesome, but gameplay wise it's pretty boring. You're given an elevated state of the armager where you fly around and shoot until it dies. Kind of a letdown compared to the visual ordeal. Chapter 10 starts several weeks after what happened in Alticia. The group is on a train and it's revealed that during the event, Ignis was injured and temporarily lost his sight. Gladio walks up to Noctis and gives him shit for being upset, calling him a coward and some other junk. I'm here, aren't I? Maybe when you're not too busy moping, you can look around and give a shit about someone worse off than you. When their train comes to the stop, the group exits to an old quarry where they're in search of a royal tomb. When you go to enter the elevator, Ignis asks if you're ready to go and you can tell him that either he can come or you're going to leave him behind. Neither option matters though as he'll join you either way. During this dungeon, the emotion is very tense. If Noctis steps too far away or is going too quickly, someone will tell him to stop. Particularly with Gladio and Noctis, the relationship is pretty shaken. Too much to ask you to shut it? Well, then he should be free to choose. There's more to it than just what he wants. After finishing the boss and retrieving the royal arm, the group has a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. Ignis decides he'll stay or leave at Noctis' discretion because he's the king. Noctis decides that he could never continue on without one of his best friends and asks Ignis to remain. After returning and boarding the train, everyone feeling a little better, we see Arden watching from a short distance and also boarding the train. <laughs> this actually might be my favorite chapter in the game. I didn't have this feeling when I first played the game, maybe Luna's death was so disappointing that I was still annoyed, or just annoyed at the game in general, but during this playthrough where I could finally look at things a little clearer, I really enjoyed the tension in the group. This is the first time some frustrated emotion enters the group and it felt legitimate. Despite my feelings about Chapter 9's story, the tone it set for Chapter 10 worked really well because the characters were understandably upset. Gladio's attitude towards Noctis still might be a little unfair, but at the same time there's a very important matter at hand and Gladio is there to keep Noctis focused. Gladio isn't the best with his words though, so this time the game's intended tone actually works. In terms of gameplay, the chapter was also pretty good. This was the forested swampy dungeon I was talking about that I enjoyed. It was visually interesting and the tone of the story made it feel even more uneasy. Ignis being blind also changed how he functioned in a fight. During this chapter he obtains a new technique that allows him to damage an enemy with its elemental weakness. It doesn't wildly change how fights work because the majority of damage is dealt by Noctis and not the others, but thematically it's really fascinating. It's awesome to see the dynamic of the group change so late in the game. Again, it's not massive, but I thought it was great. Shortly after their journey begins again, Noctis finds himself sitting alone and suddenly time stops. Confused, he gets up to investigate when Arden speaks and reveals he's the cause. Noctis tries to hit him and this begins a short chase scene through the train. It's me the chills. How are you doing here? What's going on? During this time, Arden is continuously saying very bizarre things, at least for him to say, while Noctis tries desperately to attack him. Seriously, man. Cut it out. After cornering him, the train suddenly stops to a halt and Noctis falls to the ground. Prompto wakes Noctis up and is alerted to Arden's presence. Ignis and Gladio are nowhere to be found, but Magitech troopers are trying to destroy the train. After defending the train some more, Noctis finds Prompto held at gunpoint by Arden. Noctis hits Arden off the train, but as he falls, he suddenly changes into Prompto, and Arden slowly walks in from the side and knocks out Noctis. Chapter 11, just like 10, was not amazing to me in my first playthrough. Again, I think it was because I was distracted by how bad I thought everything was. But when I was playing this part again, something had suddenly clicked with me when I was chasing Arden. All the lines he was saying were really cringy to me at first. They weren't something he would say at all, and I just didn't get why they did that. Then it all just clicked. 
I don't know how I managed to miss this the first time around, but I realized that just like when Noctis knocks Prompto off the train thinking it was Arden, this is Prompto that Noctis is chasing, but he thinks it's Arden. This isn't some phenomenal sequence, but the realization made me appreciate it a lot more, and I thought it was a lot stronger than before. So, just like Chapter 10, I went from thinking it was not very good to being one of my favorite chapters. My main question that comes to mind, though, is how strong Arden is. They haven't shown a whole lot of what he can do, but clearly he is some sort of magical being, and my concern became that he might be framed as so powerful that it's inconceivable that he could be beaten. Usually when games or movies do this, the way they're stopped ends up being extremely lame. That's not a huge concern for him at the moment, though. I think what happened here is really interesting. As far as gameplay, there's not too much different to this chapter. The only real fighting portion is defending the train, which is just defeating a few ways of enemies before they damage the train too much. Afterward, while you're on the train, you have to warp to various ships in the air before they destroy the train. This is a pretty interesting sequence. It's not super hard or anything, but it's a unique portion, and it's kind of exciting. Noctis wakes up on top of the train and heads back inside to meet Ignis and Gladio, where he explained what happens to Prompto. As the train comes to its next stop at Tenebrae, we see that House Florae, where Luna grew up, has been burned down. Aranea appears and Noctis assumes she's behind it, but it turns out she had left the Empire and has come here in a relief effort. Noctis speaks to Maria, a retainer for House Florae. She says that Ravis will be overjoyed to hear that Noctis got the ring from Luna. We see a cutscene showing that Luna is clearly ill and Ravis implores her to continue, for Noctis must get the ring and it is her destiny. We also find that he has King Regis's sword and wishes to give it to Noctis. The reason Luna was getting ill seems to be due to Arax's oracle, which also goes along with something Arden says in Chapter 9. It's also noted that daylight is getting shorter and nighttime longer. No, I cannot accept it. The train sets off again until it becomes blocked by large icicles, right beside the corpse of Shiva, another of the six astrals. After a short fight, they head back into the train, but Noctis finds Arden once more and Gladio and Ignis on the ground freezing. As they talked, Gentiana suddenly appears and freezes Arden, revealing that she is actually Shiva. In a September update, they added a couple new cutscenes to this section while talking to Shiva. One of these adds to some of the lore, explaining that there were six astrals united by a shared purpose. Apparently, she did not care for humans like her beloved Ifrit. However, he warms her heart and she begins to care for humans. After long, though, some begin to reject the gods they once worshipped, which infuriates Ifrit, who now wishes to destroy all humans of Bilt. This starts a war that eventually sees the world ruined and scarred, and the gods all go into sleeping. Sometime later, Ifrit is approached by a man who draws him away from the light. Shiva senses this, but when she wishes to aid him, she's taken up by the Nephilim Empire, who she says are now one with the darkness, which is going to swallow the gods and world together, whose fate is in Noctis' hand. Shiva gives her blessing to Noctis, and Noctis destroys the frozen Arden. I'd like to call you Noct. For a moment I felt death's chill wind. Such is the might of the gods. But then I remembered I'm immortal. As Noctis regains his strength and goes to meet them, Arden appears once more and reveals that he's immortal. He taunts Noctis about Prompto, urging him to continue to Gralia, the capital of the Empire. My feelings at least. Okay, so that was a lot of exposition in one chapter, especially a short one. There's some context gained about the state of the world, with emphasis on darkness, an actual tangible thing that was brought on by a meteor by a freed during the war. It just feels a little frustrating because I've had two playthroughs, but I still need to look some stuff up to make sense of everything, and some of it I'm not even sure where you're supposed to find out. Green Enix released a lot of stuff explaining the lore, but didn't bother putting a lot of it in the game. Some of the stuff on screen here was gathered from reading things outside of the game, which causes a lot of the lore actually explained in the game to be incomplete. I do like this chapter a lot though, specifically the cutscenes with Arden. I actually like the new ones they added too, despite being a bit lore heavy so suddenly. Though it does continue my concern about Arden's power being very strong. With him being immortal, it's hard to imagine a way for him to be beaten, and I get more worried that it'll be some huge deus ex machina thing. I couldn't find explicitly where it said verbatim in the game, but I read that the reason Ravis is now in favor of Noctis is because he saw his strength against Leviathan. As far as gameplay though, there's not a lot different here. A short boss fight and that's pretty much it. Before I get to 13, I'll talk about the second DLC chapter that came out, detailing what happened to Prompto. There's a pretty important piece of information shown in this DLC that was originally just shown in chapter 13, but chronologically this occurs first. Prompto finds himself in a Magitech facility. Arden, as always, mysteriously appears and gives him his gun, urging him to meet his father, as Prompto was apparently born here. Not wishing to believe it, he continues onward, but he finds audio logs from Verstyle Pacythia, the Empire's main Magitech researcher, talking about how they produce troopers from demonized human clones. We had also seen him in the Chapter 3 cutscene that introduced Ravis. Prompto notices the clones have the same barcode that he seems to have tattooed on him. 
He confronts Verstale, whose DNA is the source of all the clones. He seems to be transforming into a demon due to Star Scourge, which I'll explain after the summary here. He uses the Star Scourge coupled with Magitech technology to create enhanced beings and seeks to turn himself into this greatest weapon yet. He attempts to afflict Prompto, but is shot. Aranea shows up out of nowhere and helps Prompto, and the two work to dismantle the facility. They defeat the monsters and Prompto heads out to find his friends, but before he can do so, Arden captures him again and locks him up. So the piece of information that we got was Prompto isn't human, but a clone meant to become a Magitech trooper. That's kind of an interesting development, and the way it's displayed in this DLC is way better than how it is in 13. There's another piece of information that I mentioned that's a bit more confusing, this Star Scourge. Star Scourge is the darkness that Ifrit had brought down that turns creatures into demons. The thing is, though, I actually can't remember when this is first brought into the story, at least not when it's actually referred to as Star Scourge. Usually people would just say darkness, which seems ambiguous if you don't know what Star Scourge is. When reading summaries and some other things, it was mentioned a lot and very matter-of-factly, but I can't recall when it's first brought up in the game, so I'm just doing so here. It's the force that Bahamut, the leader of the Astrals, had granted humankind the crystal in order to stop. This was also the purpose of the first chosen king and oracle. A lot of the story is straightforward in Final Fantasy XV until you reach these concepts that things become a little bit muddier. But I do like the information this DLC gives is more just clarification, rather than brand new, necessary information to understand the rest of the story. In terms of gameplay, this is considerably different from the rest of the game. When playing as Prompto, you use guns. The pistol's an auto lock on, just like the regular game. But you can also find an assault rifle, a sniper rifle, and a rocket launcher that function like a third person shooter, which is a pretty big change. It's a great idea, but uh, did not work very well. The assault rifle felt pretty decent to use, but the gameplay changes were mostly pretty unresponsive and didn't feel finished. There was a small free roam section of this DLC though, with a couple side quests that I didn't get around to doing because the gameplay just isn't good enough. You can upgrade your snowmobile too, but there isn't much of a reason to do so that I know of. The worst part of this DLC though was the boss fight. It's an on-rails driving section where you use a minigun with infinite ammo to shoot a giant snake-like robot that Verstale turned himself into. You simply shoot each glowing part and slowly kill it while it doesn't even have some sort of missile function that you have to shoot out of the air. Nothing. It was one of the easiest fights in the entire game, let alone the DLC, and one of the most boring. The DLC just, uh, it didn't work for me. Out of every single chapter in the game, this is probably the one that has changed the most from release to current. Not significantly, but there were some positive changes here. This is also the longest chapter and it'll take me a bit longer to go through than the others, and while I know I've already summarized maybe too much, I feel it's necessary to do so in order for you guys to see where my criticisms come from. Somewhere inside the Imperial capital, Noctis becomes separated from Gladio and Ignis. Noctis is forced to finally don the Ring of Lucii, as for some unknown reason, he's unable to conjure his weapons. <laughs> After fighting through the keep, Noctis finds Ravis' dead body, where he also obtains Regis' sword. And yes, this is actually how you find out that Ravis dies. He comes across an area of locked doors. If you haven't played the Prompto DLC, this is where you'd find out what he is. Arden explains that the Empire had made a lot of progress in the science of demons, thanks to him. He doesn't outright claim Prompto is a clone, but he alludes to it. That was close. After some more trekking, the three reunite. In an update sometime this year, they focused very heavily on this chapter. They added a playable section bridging Gladio and Ignis' journey from when they split up with Noctis to when they meet up again. Before that, we had no idea what they did between those instances. After some of their own trekking, they reach an area where they use a computer to see if they can locate Noctis and Prompto. They don't, but a single recording remains that shows a cutscene where the Emperor is talking to Ravis, asking about the power of the Leviathan and his ring. Ravis says they're in the possession of Noctis, the true king. The Emperor, who is succumbing to Star Scourge, summons demons to kill Ravis. Just then, Arden shows up and kills Ravis, disguised as Noctis. I've indulged your false heroism for far too long. You tried to save the world in my stead, but it wasn't enough. The crystal chose me, not you. After some further fighting, they find a way to unlock the room housing the crystal, but are ambushed by a creature that the Emperor has transformed into. They kill it and continue a bit more until they reach Noctis. The part where Arden says you tried to save the world in my stead but it wasn't enough, at least to me, seems to imply that maybe Ravis had always been trying to help Luna, and his place in the Empire was to gain trust, or some sort of sabotage, and knowing Arden this isn't something that would have gotten by him. I'm not sure if this is the case and he was actually always like that, as he did seem to dislike Noctis for the first while, but it would make him a little more interesting as we don't get to see enough of him for me to believe he would have had such a major change of heart. It's possible that that is the case, but if it is then I would have liked to see him more. 
Only a short while after being reunited, they find Prompto locked up. They have a small emotional scene and continue on together. They reach a room that's locked, and Ignis thinks inside is the key to restoring Noctis' power. Though they believe there's no way in, Prompto claims there is. He uses his barcode to get in, proving that he is indeed a clone born of the Empire. They have another short, emotional scene where the other three say origin doesn't matter and that they're friends forever. After a bit more fighting, they reach a large, empty room where only a boss fight can happen. Sure enough, it does, and a mutated Ravis enters the room, pleading for death, which turned out to be my favorite boss fight in the game. After beating him, they are bombarded by demons, and Noctis is forced to continue on alone, while the others handle them. Noctis reaches the crystal, but as he touches it, he finds it slowly pulling him in. Arden uses his time to come forward. He mentions a scourge that plagued humanity many years ago that turned people into monsters. There was a savior in Lucis that could cure people who had turned by absorbing the scourge from them, healing many people, the chosen king. However, in doing so, he found the scourge began to change him, and the gods no longer deemed him worthy of chosen king. A jealous king who had demonized him to the people was chosen in his stead. He then reveals that the name he had told them was not totally true. His real name was... Arden Lucis Kylum is my proper name. He says you'll never guess whose name Azunia was. This is sort of ambiguous, but I'll get to that in a second. Arden says killing Noctis as a mortal would be unsatisfying, and he needs Noctis to claim the crystal's power before he would be happy to kill him, and he can finally have redemption once the king and crystal are no more. After Noctis is fully enveloped by the crystal, the other three run in and try to kill Arden, who just gets back up and is taken a slightly demonic form. We then see another cutscene with Bahamut speaking to Noctis. He claims the crystal is the soul of the planet, where Noctis will gain his strength to fulfill his destiny. He explains that with all the covenants done, they'll finally see the crystal shed all of its light into the Ring of Lucii, and then the true king can complete his ascension. Only by the true king can the immortal accursed, meaning Arden, be destroyed. He explains that Arden's immortality came from the scourge he absorbed into his body, and his mind twisted and became obsessed with revenge. The last thing he says that in order to receive the power he needs, Noctis must visit the throne of the Chosen, but it will come at a cost, his life. Noctis awakes ten years later to a darkened world. Be waiting. In Hammerhead. Uh, holy moly. Okay, so there's a lot of information here. Some of it's up for debate to a lot of people, at least until Square Enix confirms some things, but basically we see that Arden was the original king chosen to rid the world of the Scourge, which I realize might now actually be the first time it's explained, though without the star attached to it. He takes it all in, but it twists him and he essentially becomes the Scourge itself and is cast aside. Someone else is given the throne, and this is presumably who Azunia actually is. There was a theory I heard that Azunia is a relative to Arden and was jealous, but it's unknown. Either way, Arden wants to kill the Lucis Kylum bloodline out of revenge, but wants to do so by killing the true king, ending the line and destroying the crystal. When I first played this game, I thought Arden was a terrible villain. I thought his reasoning for helping them throughout the game was flimsy, even though it was an interesting concept, and he was just needlessly evil for no reason. After my second playthrough, though, I've almost done a complete 180 on how I feel about him. He still needs more explanation, but I see a lot more strength in his behavior now. He basically screws with Noctis to encourage him to continue his journey to Ascend so he can finally end everything and get revenge on the king, presumably Noctis' actual ancestor, who had taken the throne, and he can destroy the crystal and get revenge on the gods who had once turned him away. By actual ancestor, I mean the one who had taken the throne from Arden may have taken Arden's name too, meaning Noctis isn't actually of Lucis Kylum descent. That or Azunia was perhaps Arden's brother and had the same family name, because otherwise it wouldn't make sense for him to want revenge on his own line. The reason I may have not had the feeling about him in my first try was because I was so disinterested at this point of the game that I don't really think I realized what Arden was explaining to Noctis. The only issue I have with these theories in general is why anyone would have forgotten the names of the original king. You'd think that'd be something everyone learned. Then again, no one seems to know anyone in this world. Anyway, he's not perfect and the story is not great by any means, but my second playthrough and some added context by newer cutscenes made this entire section a little more interesting. Unfortunately, this is a result of the original game being very incomprehensive, and it seemed like there was a lot of cut content. It still feels like that, however, but it's a lot better now. They didn't seem to focus much on Prompto not being human, though. He tells them and they just go, oh, yeah, that's cool, whatever. I'm all for them accepting him for what he is, but they don't even seem shocked or bewildered. Fits with a lot of other parts of the game, though, where the game just says, hey, feel sad now, without giving the appropriate content to do so. The added section of Gladio and Ignis together was good, and we finally got to see the Emperor again. One of the biggest surprises to me was how much the game ended up being about Arden and not the Emperor. I'm not saying it's bad that Arden was the main villain, but I expected the story to be more like Final Fantasy XII, more political and about different kingdoms, rather than prophecies and gods. That's not a negative or positive thing, really, just not what I anticipated. It did seem to make the Emperor a very minimal part of the game, though, compared to the movie. 
Let's talk about the gameplay here though. This is the longest chapter by a long shot and it's a pretty big curveball. Chapters 9 through 12 are linear but are faster. Chapter 13 is a massive stretch of long corridors with Noctis all on his own, contrasting completely with the open world parts of the game. Most of this focuses on using the ring finally though, rather than swords. The ring has three attacks. The first is death used by holding circle, which drains enemies health and kills them with an applied debuff, healing Noctis for half of his max HP. Some enemies are immune to death, but many will die very, very quickly. The second is Holy, used by holding Square, that dodges enemy attacks and deals light damage at the cost of MP, some of which you'll recover per dodge. The third is Alterna, used by holding Triangle, which charges up a small spell that when cast uses all mana to warp nearby enemies into a different dimension. The ring was widely regarded as complete garbage and it made this entire chapter absolutely terrible to play. It was long, boring, and difficult because of the crappy ring and the enemies that dealt large amounts of damage that you were encouraged to hide from. That's why there was a patch that dealt largely with this chapter. It added the new scenes, Ignis and Gladio's section, and it significantly buffed the Ring of Lucii. It made Death do more damage, it made Alterna work on every single enemy in the game, including bosses, and it made Holy do more damage as well. Holy also got one more specific mechanic that I want to talk about badly, but I'm going to save that for after the story. I will say that the buffs to the ring made this section more interesting to go through because I was able to take the atmosphere in a little more. While respecting Arden as a villain more too, it made the whole segment better. Not perfect, but better. The last thing here is the Ravis fight. I mentioned it being one of my favorite boss fights and that's because it finally felt like you had to actually react to what he was going to do. He had good telegraphs which is majorly important to me in a game like this, so the combat feels more reactive and less chancy. This is one of the few fights that delivered in that regard. My only issue is he, like a lot of other things in the game, does too much damage. Without the bonus of Ignis's meals, I suppose, but when you're about the same level as the boss you're fighting, I don't think he should be able to one-shot multiple party members with an ability. But to be fair on the other side, you're not able to control where anyone but Noctis goes, and since the game relies heavily on items, it makes sense for this fight that he would do a large amount of damage with evident telegraphs, so you can dodge them and revive your party members. Either way, it's a high point in the game for me as far as combat goes, I just wish there were more fights like it. I'm going to summarize this chapter much more quickly. Noctis is woken up 10 years later and finds the whole world in complete darkness. He moves inland and is picked up in a truck by none other than Talcott, all grown up. They go to Hammerhead, where Noctis meets Ignis, Gladio, and Prompto again, and they're pretty much just like, oh hey. They reminisce at one last campfire and head to Insomnia. You have a fight with Efreet first before Noctis ends up fighting Arden alone. After killing him, Noctis says goodbye to his friends and he heads to the throne, where he's absorbed into the ring. After the credits roll, we see a couple more cutscenes. At the final campfire the group had, Noctis explains that he'll have to give his life to banish the darkness. He had made his peace, but had one more heartfelt moment with his friends. You guys... are the best. We see the sun finally raise once more, and Noctis sits on the throne with Luna, both in wedding attire. They fade away afterwards, showing that they reunited in the afterlife. This concludes the story. So, everything has come to a head and Arden is finally killed. Though at the same time Arden got his wish. The Lucis bloodline is ended, the crystals destroyed, and the darkness is finally gone for good now that Arden has died. A lot of times villains who wield immense power always get brought down by some bullshit, like in some movies I mentioned earlier. These movies and more feature an omnipotent villain who is brought down by something with poorly explained abilities that completely undermines the strength that had built up in these villains. I actually thought at the end that Final Fantasy XV had dealt with this very well. After my second playthrough, I understood more of his insight and reasoning, and the only way he could get his revenge is by killing or being killed by the true king, who could only become such if he fulfilled everything Arden helped him to do. I couldn't believe that after my first playthrough, I actually ended up liking him. One of the reasons, though, is that I looked up more about him. Some of the things I said about him were not things I was aware of in my first time. I either missed some facts or read some now that clarified them further. Either way, I think he was actually good, aside from the fight. The gameplay in this chapter is just like any other, but the fight against Arden is a bit different. The first phase is normal and a good fight. The second phase, however, is just like the second phase against Leviathan. You enter a permanent and stronger armager, as does Arden himself, and begin a fight that looked straight out of Dragon Ball Z. You zip around aimlessly holding circle with little attention. It's a really boring fight aside from visuals and kind of a lame way to go out in terms of gameplay. 
although there is a short third phase to the fight that I quite liked. It's nothing huge, it's a simple bare bones slap fest with Arden that's more for narrative emotion than anything else. The one thing I can compare it to is the fight in Metal Gear Solid 4 against Ocelot, though that has the benefit of three prequels to culminate the emotion better. But I like the one here too, I'm just a sucker for that kind of last strength thing I guess. The other major flaw of this chapter is how open it is. When games go through a transformative state, it's really cool to see how the world has changed. Think Ocarina of Time, you skip 10 years and Hammerhead is a base rather than a garage now. But what about the rest of the map? Well, too bad. Aside from the Golden K where you start, you don't get to see any of it. In fact, you don't get to see any one. Cindy's reference, Iris is said to have become a great hunter, and that's basically it. There aren't even many other major characters, but RNA gets no mention, and we don't even get to see Cindy or Iris, even though Cindy still works at Hammerhead. I mean, for fuck's sake, we got to see Talcott. No one cares about Talcott. This would have been a perfect opportunity to reintroduce the open world, or at least give a good chunk of it, and see how things had changed. You could also use it as a time to fight very powerful monsters. Insomnia is filled with high-level demons, and they could have done the same with most of the land. It's a hugely missed opportunity. With the monthly updates they've had, I hope one day we'll see them return to this, but it's kind of doubtful. With all that said, that brings our story to an end. A last few comments on the gameplay in these chapters though, they didn't do enough with them. I may have come around to the story for these sections, but chapter 11 and 12 didn't have enough to do. Simply a boss fight in a train ride. It would have been nice to see other regions like Tenebrae fleshed out more, perhaps other smaller open world areas. That would have taken a lot of work, but the game was in development for an awfully long time and it wasn't finished. But it actually looks like they may have wanted to include some other areas as places you could genuinely roam. I'll link it down below, but there's a video where someone has a glitched version of the stronger armager mode, where he's able to fly around to these other locations and see other spots. There are a lot of set pieces here that have a lot of detail for something that you could never even get to, or even see in some areas, and a lot of it is physically there and not just visual. I'm not a game developer, so maybe that's how it had to be, but there's something suspicious about this entire thing. My only hope is that they somehow expand the game in future DLCs to include these other regions more. After beating the game, you gain access to a bunch of new things. You reloaded a save outside of the Citadel where you can contact Umbra, a dog Noctis used his whole life to contact Luna. I left this out because it serves absolutely no importance until you reach this point. Umbra has the ability to take you back in time to either Altitia or the mainland you play during chapters 1 through 8. I'm not sure if this is technically canonical or if it's just included to give you a way to keep playing, I guess it doesn't really make a difference, but it's pretty strange. This is how you're able to return after beating the game though. Before I get to the differences, I want to mention two things I left out about the Ring of Lucii buffs. Holding Square will cause Holy to dodge the same way phasing works without wearing the ring. However, if you just tap Square right as an enemy strikes, it'll do mass damage, cause the enemy to fly further away, and will restore a great amount of mana. I'm not exaggerating when I say this is easily my favorite mechanic in the entire game. It acts similarly to blocking, but there's no prompt. Some enemies attack quickly, and without the prompt, you're actually required to react with good timing. You're rewarded with decent damage and can be a good way to regenerate mana without items. This is the kind of mechanic I wanted from the rest of the game. Precise timing, good feedback, and a solid reward for performing it. I love it and I found myself trying to use it a lot afterwards. Unfortunately, the rest of the ring, probably even more so after buffs, is a disappointment to me. Originally I liked death, it felt cool to use, and it regenerates health outside of using potions, which is better to me. The issue was how weak it was, and now the issue is how strong it is. Against some enemies it hardly works, but many others will die very quickly if they're weak to that magic, even enemies well above your level. It can make clearing some groups of enemies very fast, but really boring, because just like regular attacks all you have to do is hold circle, but this can be done while standing still out of range. What I would have liked to see was using the ring earlier in the game and that could function as your cure spell. Rather than possibly causing instant death to some enemies, it could just sap HP from them to recover. This would have been a much better use in my opinion. What about Alterna though? This is the dumbest ability in the whole game. Originally it couldn't work on more important bosses, but the patch made it work on every single thing in the game. This means that you can enter a boss fight, cast it, and be done. The worst thing is that this is completely random, though I think it's more difficult depending on the level or their size. I'm not sure, but I don't think I ever saw it fail on smaller or lower level enemies, though that could just be anecdotal. But even still, it's a random chance which makes the spell just luck to skip an entire fight. Since MP is so easy to restore with items though, you can keep doing it over and over. Even better, Noctis can't be knocked out of casting it unless by losing all his health. I wanted to save all that until now because it brings me to probably the most important of post-game content. There are 8 endgame dungeons that have secret entrances deep inside some of the main dungeons. I was very excited for these as I didn't know they existed until many hours into my second playthrough. I was therefore extraordinarily disappointed when I actually did them. Six of them are completely identical. 
They're a generic looking cave no matter what the design of the main dungeon was. They feature hallways bridging empty rooms that have small groups of enemies to fight. Every single room had a single type of enemy in every single one of these dungeons. I'm not kidding, and a significant amount of them weren't even unique, many not even a reskin at the very least of other enemies. Most were just a very basic enemy that had been simply upscaled in level. It was a really boring design and made them dull to go through, but necessary because it contained some of the best weapons. There were two notable dungeons which were castle themed instead of caves. The easier of the two was taking me a really long time before I looked it up, wondering if I had missed something. I read that it takes multiple real life hours. I beat it, but I really didn't expect that. Now if it was an actually interesting dungeon, this could have been great. The other was similar, but one extra caveat. You couldn't use items. I mentioned that I had only died a couple times outside of a certain dungeon, and this is the dungeon I referred to. This is where me talking about Alterna comes into play. The dungeon's level 99, so there's many powerful enemies. Because the games emphasized items so heavily and I was only level 85 or so, this was a difficult dungeon, which is why I wish the mechanics were tighter so these could be more conceivably finished despite being underleveled, without having to cheese the fights. And I did, with the ring's alterna power. I wasn't going to do this because I expected powerful, unique enemies, instead they were copy-pasted from the rest of the game, the dungeons were so boring that I needed to just get through them. So I did this to almost every single room and almost every single boss. Pop, 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 pop. This is because you can just sit and wait for your mana to quickly regenerate before entering the next room. Like every other piece of broken weaponry, someone can just tell me not to use it. I'll say for a third time that this ignores a serious problem. The combat was designed in an unfun way, with emphasis on items, and gave us a myriad of overpowered equipment. The only way for me to get through this dungeon without dying of boredom was to do what I did, and this is just bad design. I did something similar with two very important fights. The first one, there's a very large mountain near Hammerhead. You can receive a quest to investigate some small earthquakes, and it turns out that this mountain is actually alive. It's a giant adamantois, a turtle mountain. This is a hunt you can do, and was said to take an hour or more to fight it. That sounds incredible, and I was really excited to do this. However, the real fight turns out to be another boring experience. It's essentially a giant wall that moves slowly and does damage in a shockwave without real telegraphed attacks that can be dealt with. I don't want to criticize them too heavily because, clearly looking at it, there's almost no conceivable way for them to have made this a fun fight. It's simply too large. So I did what I thought couldn't be possible. I cast an alterna on its head for maybe 20 minutes straight. It finally worked, and sure enough, the giant turtle was sucked into a new dimension. This massive, crazy one-hour fight can just be removed from the game. I read online it took some people less than 5 casts, some more than 100. It's completely random and a terrible part of the game. In fact, it made me curious. I fought Arden once more, and before the Armager phase, I cast an alterna on him too. And it worked. Yep, I sucked Arden, the final boss, into a new dimension. This actually only skips the first phase, though. On the one hand, I think this is kind of stupid. On the other hand, I think not only is it funny, but generally I don't like the idea of mechanics being restricted against certain enemies. Now, this might be one of my exceptions where I'm okay with being restricted against certain enemies, but again, I think it's just kind of funny that you can do it. That said, I think they should have just tied the ring to magic use. I think that could have been pretty cool. I'll say once more, though, yes, I know you could have fought the Adamantois regularly. In fact, I did. I went back and fought it for about 35 minutes before getting really tired of it and realized nothing interesting happens in this fight other than the size of the thing. I'm not expecting them to be Shadow of the Colossus or something, but I would rather them not put a fight like this in the game at all if they can't make it engaging. There's not a ton more post-game content, it's mostly a way to go back and finish things you missed and max out your level in Ascension. There is, however, one more dungeon that's available after beating the game. It's the hidden dungeon I spoke of earlier. There's absolutely no enemies in this dungeon. It's easily the most unique one in the game, featuring an emphasis on puzzles and platforming. I'll, well, puzzle is a generous word, but they're actually alright. The platforming, however, is the worst thing I've ever seen. I like to exaggerate a lot, but seriously, it's terrible. This game is not meant to be a platformer. I would have just done another review of Crash if I wanted to do a bunch of platforming. No, but really, I would have loved this if the controls were meant for this. There's a handful of tricky jumps that caused this dungeon to take me four hours. Some of that time was getting stuck, but I was constantly dying because Noctis' momentum can be really awkward, and I would constantly screw up jumps because of it. It's not my fault, okay? I'm really great. I beat this, didn't I? And there is actually a part of this dungeon that involves a side-scrolling section. It's infuriating, and I just wish the game was made so that this would work better, because the design itself was awesome. Unfortunately, this dungeon brought on something else that was also terrible. You have to fly your Gregalia Type F, and the entire process of flying can be inconsistent. I spent four hours in this dungeon and went to fly out of the area to leave, and that's when this happened. <laughs> Whoa! When you attempt to take off, you can't turn reliably. My immediate thought was, hmm, do I have enough room to take off here? And I didn't. Luckily, I had all the footage I needed, and the black hood you get for beating the dungeon, which allows Noctis to automatically dodge enemy attacks, is broken enough that I wouldn't even want to use it. Not that I have anything else to fight at this point anyway. 
I do appreciate Square Enix including post-game content though, I always really enjoy having things to do after technically beating the game. There have been two DLC things aside from Prompto, Gladio, Comrades, and the newly released Ignis chapters. One was the Moogle Chocobo Festival that takes place in Altitia. It's a combat-free, just-for-fun event with some little games to play like extra chocobo races, and you also get some outfits from it. There's not much to go into, it was a nice break from seriousness that the game's first five chapters would have reveled in. Actually, to tie in something I said very early in this video, this was one of the exceptions to warping. Targeted warping is very uncommon outside of combat, but for whatever reason this event allowed you to zip all over Altitia, even though the regular Altitia portion of the game doesn't allow this. The second DLC was also an event, but this one was a little weirder. Moogles and Chocobos have existed in almost every Final Fantasy game, so that was a theme that made sense for the most part. This second event was an Assassin's Creed crossover where Assassin's Creed exists as a franchise in this world. I expected this to be really bad because of the nature of game crossovers and specifically because it was Assassin's Creed. I actually ended up enjoying this a fair amount. It didn't have any amazing minigames, many were the same as the Moogle Festival, but it did add some items and some outfits like the one I wore for the majority of the game. I thought it looked cool, but it didn't mean that Noctis was cosplaying as a video game character during this extremely serious adventure, but I can live with that. Even though this one does contain some real combat, it's mostly just for fun and was a needed break from a more serious tone in the base game, just like the other event. It has one questline where you receive clues that lead you around the city trying to solve riddles. They were actually really cool and took a long time. I want to talk characters, though I won't say anything about Arden as I've already done that quite a lot. I think Noctis, Gladio, and Ingus were pretty good. Noctis could have used a bit more personality, but he was fine as an avatar to play through. Gladio was good and Ignis was even better, though my one issue was really not knowing where these guys come from. Evidently, Ignis is Noctis' advisor, which is why he's always saying what to do. Before reading that, and yes, I mean reading that because it doesn't tell you in game, I thought he was just a pushy dickhead sometimes. Prompto was only okay, his interactions with the group were alright, but a lot of his dialogue was the worst of the four, and his place in the team was really weird and kind of unnecessary. Like this. Ugh, I'm all sticky and gross. Woohoo! Bat time! Oh yeah, like a boss. You ready for this? Boom! I mean, Gladio was the shield, Ignis was the advisor, Prompto was just their scared friend who didn't know anything about anything. The issue I had with them all was a lot of the time they were driving, unless there was a story development, they barely spoke. If they did speak, it was just a couple of lines and that's it. As well, the writers seem to always give each of them a single line of dialogue in almost every single instance. One by one they say their own thing and it makes a lot of the conversations feel forced. There also just weren't enough lines in general. I'm sure the script was really long, but during the general gameplay there were repeat lines very often. I wish they had focused on longer, more contextual conversations, but fewer of them. I did like how they behaved with each other though, they did seem like a real group of friends. Unfortunately, Arden was the only character besides them who had enough exposure to really say if they were good or bad. The others are given the illusion of relevance, but not displayed enough to deserve that. RNA shows up at four different occasions, and half of those are really short. The Empire Base where you fight her, the dungeon, Tenebrae, and Prompto's DLC. She doesn't really do anything. Iris is even worse for this, there seems to be some sort of implied feelings between her and Noctis, at least on her end, but we never get to see them interact enough for it to even matter, she has no bearing on the story. Luna and Ravis could have stood to get more exposure too. Like Arden, I came around to liking Ravis quite a bit too. I don't dislike Luna of course, but her character didn't have a ton of depth. Ravis's issue was a lot of his depth was displayed by being told by someone else. His change of heart for Noctis isn't shown very well, some of these major characters just seemed like an afterthought. But surprisingly enough, these characters have piqued my interest enough that I actually do want to see more of all of them. If they do plan on further content for the characters, I'd like to see the main four receive more backstory, followed by the others I mentioned. The developers talked about maybe doing an Arden-based sequel, and many fans have supported that. My issue is that, despite liking him as a character and some of the backstory being a bit rushed, I think he works better of just having heard of his past. He'll likely receive a DLC chapter at the very least, but I think there are other characters that it would work better for, particularly ones that survive after the story. Speaking of which, typically I have this feeling where I don't like playing in an open world game where the main character dies at the end. Narratively, I'm completely fine with it, but there's something irritating to me about finishing a story and in order to continue playing, I have to play in a file that hasn't technically beaten the game yet. It's not a big issue, more of a personal problem than an actual bad thing, but that's how I feel. Since one of the main points for making this video was to establish how the game has changed since launch, I'll just briefly list most of the changes while also addressing whether it made me change how I felt about the game. The first major change was adding Gladio and Ignis' playable section in Chapter 13, the cutscene of Ravis being killed, and also the buffs to the Ring of Lucii. This made Chapter 13 a lot better. 
They also added Gladio's DLC, which was cool because you got to play as a new character, and while it was short, it was pretty decent. Next was adding the Regalia Type D, which significantly improved the exploration. Promptel's DLC was not really amazing, but it was a decent story add-on. The two festivals were surprisingly good, and it was nice to have a more relaxed atmosphere for once. The only update I thought was a bad addition was the one that added cross chains and exosuits. It wasn't a huge change, but the added lore in Chapter 12 made it a lot tighter. More recently, they raised the hunt capacity to 10 from 1. It was a no-brainer that took them a year, but it's still a positive change. All in all, the game has improved quite well since it came out. Unfortunately, not many of these have improved the combat itself, aside from the ring's holy ability, so while I would definitely say that Final Fantasy XV has gotten a lot better, it still has subpar combat and is often a chore to play. Originally, this video was supposed to be done at the tail end of November, but I wasn't able to make that time. With that in mind, I deliberately left out the Comrades update so I can include it in a future, smaller video that'll go over Ignis' DLC and the December update. The update lets you play as the other three characters, and that changes one of my comments about the game only allowing you to play as Noctis. The update looks like it'll improve gameplay a bit, so that's good. All this said, I have a weird care for this game. Maybe it's a result of loving Final Fantasy as a whole, or my immense excitement for this game's release and subsequent disappointment drove me to look further for things that I liked. Either way, this is one of those games that I probably like more than my talking points might suggest. Though, I think that's because you can view it as one of two things. A piece of art to be compared to its contemporaries, or a way to spend your time. That sounds obvious, but the point is you can still enjoy something while also acknowledging its flaws, or even not thinking it's very good when viewed critically. I think most people probably have a song or two that they don't think is that great when they really think about it, but still enjoy listening to it. So while Final Fantasy XV's story and gameplay didn't exactly compare amazingly to other titles like it, I found myself continuously playing it. Yeah, I played it a lot for this video, but I could have made a much shorter video. So that wraps up the story and gameplay, finally. I hope you enjoyed my take on it if you've stuck around for this long, but before we go I'll talk about the graphics and the music. These are probably the strongest points of the entire game. The visuals are beautiful. This game is getting a PC release next year and I can only imagine how gorgeous this game will look. Even though you can't go to a whole lot of it, it's just really great design. Breathtaking summons, gorgeous landscapes, varied environments all thrown together with some excellent visual effects and character animation. Though, unless a game is more stylized, I find it hard to elaborate much on visuals. All I can really say is if it's beautiful or ugly. Though on that note, I wish I'd spoken more meaningfully about Crash's visuals, as it's pretty stylized. Originally, this soundtrack was pretty disappointing for me. The scores in Final Fantasy games are typically top-notch, it's one of the only positives about 13. When I played 15, I was definitely upset at the music. Some of the battle themes were alright, but I didn't like the more casual songs like Hammerhead or Lestalem, it all felt kind of samey. Though, after speaking with some people who touted it as incredible, I decided to listen through the whole thing. After that, like some other things about this game, I did a full turnaround. I don't love every song, particularly the ones I already mentioned, but the soundtrack as a whole is incredible. Vals de Fantastica, which I played after the intro to this video, is a phenomenal piece of music. Same goes for many others, which is why I decided to use them for a lot of the sections of gameplay. I have a couple grievances though. One is that every single dungeon in the game plays the same song, even the end game dungeons. It's not a terrible piece of music by any means, but the tone it invokes is sometimes different from that of the story, or that of the visual feeling set by the dungeon's design. It felt a bit lazy, and made the dungeons lose a bit of uniqueness that some of them already lacked. In Metal Gear Solid 4 and 5, you can use a music player to play a good mix of songs while you play. Final Fantasy XV did something similar, where you can get various albums from other Square Enix games to play on either the car radio, or a music player you get while you're simply running around. The only mistake they made is that when you enter a battle, it'll interrupt whatever song you have on. Anytime a game gives you the choice to play any song you want, it should always supersede any song that would normally be playing. I can look past it, but I really wish that wasn't the case. I'm still not sure if there are many classics in the soundtrack though. It's still a great addition to the game, but I feel a lot of games in the past while have opted for heavily orchestral tracks. That's not wholly a bad thing, I love them personally, it just makes it a bit harder for some games to have them stand out more. I've said I'll talk about Blank later like a million times in this video, and I saved one of them for the soundtrack discussion. The time quests are good, but not everything about them. For whatever reason, time quests have their own single unique track that plays every time, and some time quests can take over 20 minutes. This is easily the worst track in the entire game, possibly every Final Fantasy, including ones I've never played, that's how confident I am. I don't have much to elaborate on this, but it deserves special mention, and I would actually mute the music anytime I did one of these. But I do want to end this section on a high note, so I'll conclude with... Final Fantasy XV constructed a beautiful world and complemented it with some brilliant melodies. Final Fantasy XV is a greatly flawed game with a semi-disjointed story. 
It has great ideas, but the execution was bad and it left the game feeling unfinished and disappointing. I'm not going to give the game a score despite having done so for Crash, as I feel it allows for people to skip the whole review, which I wouldn't prefer. I'm not really sure if I should even do this for the same reason, but essentially this is how I'd break my feelings down. It was a mediocre game made to be decent by updates that I don't regret playing, but I was definitely let down by. Despite not really loving a Final Fantasy game since 10, I still look forward to the future of the series. Hopefully they learn from their mistakes and give Final Fantasy VII the remake it deserves. You know, if it ever comes out. This was originally going to be a 30 minute video, but when I started writing I just couldn't stop. Hopefully that was for the best and I have a more interesting video to share, and I hope you all enjoyed it. I'll try not to have such a big gap between reviews like I did for this in Crash Bandicoot, but thanks for watching.